Chapter 11 of Pushing to the Front by Horizon Sweat Martin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Luke Sartor. Chapter 11 Choosing a Vocation. Be what nature intended you for, and you will succeed. Be anything else, and you will be ten thousand times worse than nothing. Sidney Smith Many a man pays for his success with a slice of his constitution. No man struggles perpetually and victoriously against his own character, and one of the first principles of success in life is so to regulate our career as rather to turn our physical constitution and natural inclinations to good account than to endeavor to counteract the one or oppose the other. Bulwer. He that hath a trade hath an estate. Franklin. Nature fits all her children with something to do. Lowell. As occupations and professions have a powerful influence upon the length of human life, the youth should first ascertain whether the vocation he thinks of choosing is a healthy one. Statesmen, judges, and clergymen are noted for their longevity. They are not swept into the great business vortex, where the friction and raspings of sharp competition whittle life away at a fearful rate. Astronomers who contemplate vast systems moving through enormous distances are exceptionally long-lived, as Herschel and Humboldt. Philosophers, scientists, and mathematicians as Galileo, Bacon, Newton, Euler, Dalton, in fact, those who have dwelt upon the exact sciences, seem to have escaped many of the ills from which humanity suffers. Great students of natural history have also, as a rule, lived long and happy lives. Of 14 members of a noted historical society in England, who died in 1870, Two were over 90, five over 80, and two over 70. The occupation of the mind has a great influence upon the health of the body. There is no employment so dangerous and destructive to life, but plenty of human beings can be found to engage in it. Of all the instances that can be given of recklessness of life, there is none which exceeds that of the workmen employed in what is called dry pointing the grinding of needles and of table forks. The fine steel dust which they breathe brings on a painful disease of which they are almost sure to die before they are forty. Yet, not only are men tempted by high wages to engage in this employment, but they resist to the utmost all contrivances devised for diminishing the danger through fear that such things would cause more workmen to offer themselves and thus lower wages. Many physicians have investigated the effects of work in the numerous match factories in France upon the health of the employees, and all agree that rapid destruction of the teeth, decay or necrosis of the jawbone, bronchitis, and other diseases result. We will probably find more old men on farms than elsewhere. There are many reasons why farmers should live longer than the persons residing in cities or than those engaged in other occupations. Aside from the purer air, the outdoor exercise, both conducive to a good appetite and sound sleep, which comparatively few in cities enjoy, they are free from the friction, harassing cares, anxieties, and the keen competition incident to city life. On the other hand, there are some great drawbacks and some enemies to longevity, even on the farm. Man does not live by bread alone. The mind is by far the greatest factor in maintaining the body in a healthy condition. The social life of the city, the great opportunities afforded the mind for feeding upon libraries and lectures, great sermons and constant association with other minds, the great variety of amusements compensate largely for the loss of many of the advantages of farm life. In spite of the great temperance and immunity 
from things which corrode, whittle and rasp away life in the cities, farmers in many places do not live so long as scientists and some other professional men. There is no doubt that aspiration and success tend to prolong life. Prosperity tends to longevity. If we do not wear life away or burn it out in the feverish pursuit of wealth, Thomas W. Higginson made a list of 30 of the most noted preachers of the last century and found that their average length of life was 69 years. Among miners in some sections, over 600 out of a thousand die from consumption. In the prisons of Europe, where the fatal effects of bad air and filth are shown, over 61% of the deaths are from tuberculosis. In Bavarian monasteries, 50% of those who enter in good health die of consumption, and in the Prussian prisons it is almost the same. The effect of bad air, filth, and bad food is shown by the fact that the death rate among these classes, between the ages of 20 and 40, is five times that of the general population of the same age. In New York City, over one-fifth of all the deaths of persons over 20 are from this cause. In large cities in Europe, the percentage is often still greater. Of 1,000 deaths from all causes, on the average, 103 farmers die of pulmonary tuberculosis, 108 fishermen, 121 gardeners, 122 farm laborers, 167 grocers, 209 tailors, 301 dry goods dealers, and 461 compositors, nearly one half. According to a long series of investigations by doctors Benoiston and Lombard into occupations or trades where workers must inhale dust, it appears that mineral dust is the most detrimental to health animal dust ranking next, and vegetable dust third. In choosing an occupation, cleanliness, pure air, sunlight and freedom from corroding dust and poisonous gases are of the greatest importance. A man who would sell a year of his life for any amount of money would be considered insane, and yet we deliberately choose occupations and vocations which statistics and physicians tell us we'll be practically sure to cut off from 5 to 25, 30 or even 40 years of our life and are seemingly perfectly indifferent to our fate. There is danger in a calling which requires great expenditure of vitality at long irregular intervals. He who is not regularly or systematically employed incurs perpetual risk. Of the 32 all-around athletes in a New York club not long ago, said a physician, three are dead of consumption, five have to wear trusses, four or five are lop-shouldered, and three have guitar and partial deafness. Dr. Patton, chief surgeon at the National Soldiers' Home at Dayton, Ohio, says that of the 5,000 soldiers in that institution, Fully, 80% are suffering from heart disease in one form or another, due to the forced physical exertions of the campaigns. Man's faculties and functions are so interrelated that whatever affects one affects all. Athletes who overdevelop the muscular system do so at the expense of the physical, mental and moral well-being. It is a law of nature that the overdevelopment of any function or faculty, forcing or straining it, tends not only to ruin it, but also to cause injurious reactions on every other faculty and function. Vigorous thought must come from a fresh brain. We cannot expect nerve, snap, robustness and vigor, sprightliness and elasticity in the speech, in the book or in the essay from an exhausted, jaded brain. The brain is one of the last organs of the body to reach maturity, at about the age of 28, and should never be overworked, especially in youth. 
the whole future of a man is often ruined by overstraining the brain in school. Brain workers cannot do good effective work in one line many hours a day. When the brain is weary, when it begins to lose its elasticity and freshness, there will be the same lack of tonicity and strength in the brain product. Some men often do a vast amount of literary work in entirely different lines during their spare hours. Cessation of brain activity does not necessarily constitute brain rest, as most great thinkers know. The men who accomplish the most brain work, sooner or later, usually later, unfortunately, learn to give rest to one set of faculties and use another as interest begins to flag and a sense of weariness comes. In this way they have been enabled to astonish the world by their mental achievements, which is very largely a matter of skill in exercising alternate sets of faculties, allowing rest to some while giving healthy exercise to others. The continual use of one set of faculties by an ambitious worker will soon bring him to grief. No set of brain cells can possibly set free more brain force in the combustion of thought than is stored up in them. The tired brain must have rest or nervous exhaustion. Brain fever or even softening of the brain is liable to follow. As a rule, physical vigor is the condition of a great career. What would Gladstone have accomplished with a weak, puny physique? He addresses an audience at Corfu in Greek and another at Florence in Italian. A little later he converses at ease with Bismarck in German or talks fluent French in Paris or piles up argument on argument in English for hours in Parliament. There are families that have clutched success and kept it through generations from the simple fact that a splendid physical organization handed down from one generation to another. All occupations that enervate, paralyze, or destroy body or soul should be avoided. Our manufacturing interests too often give little thought to the employed. The article to be made is generally the only object considered. They do not care if a man spends the whole of his life upon the head of a pin or in making a screw in a watch factory. They take no notice of the occupations that ruin, or the phosphorus, the dust, the arsenic, that destroys the health, that shortens the lives of many workers. Of the cramped condition of the body which creates deformity. The moment we compel those we employ to do work that demoralizes them or does not tend to elevate or lift them, we are forcing them into service worse than useless. If we induce painters to work in fading colors or architects with rotten stone or contractors to construct buildings with imperfect materials, we are forcing our Michelangelos to carve in snow. Ruskin says that the tendency of the age is to expand its genius in perishable art, as if it were a triumph to burn its thoughts away in bonfires. Is the work you compel others to do useful to yourself and to society? If you employ a seamstress to make four or five or six beautiful flounces for your ball dress, flounces which will only clothe yourself, in which you will wear at only one ball, you are employing your money selfishly. Do not confuse covetousness with benevolence nor cheat yourself into thinking that all the finery you can wear is so much put into the hungry mouths of those beneath you. It is what those who stand shivering on the street, forming a line to see you step out of your carriage, know it to be. These fine dresses do not mean that so much has been put into their mouths, but that so much has been taken out of their mouths. Select a clean, useful, honorable occupation if there is any doubt on this point, abandon it at once, for familiarity with a bad business will make it seem good. Choose a business that has expansiveness in it. Some kinds of business not even a J. Pierpont Morgan could make respectable. 
Choose an occupation which will develop you, which will elevate you, which will give you a chance for self-improvement and promotion. You may not make quite so much money, but you will be more of a man, and manhood is above all riches, overtops all titles, and character is greater than any career. If possible, avoid occupations which compel you to work in a cramped position, or where you must work at night and on Sundays. Don't try to justify yourself on the ground that somebody must do this kind of work. Let somebody, not yourself, take the responsibility. Aside from the right and wrong of the thing, it is injurious to the health to work seven days in the week, to work at night when nature intended you to sleep, or to sleep in the daytime when she intended you to work. Many a man has dwarfed his manhood, cramped his intellect, crushed his aspiration, blunted his finer sensibilities in some mean, narrow occupation just because there was money in it. Study yourself says Longfellow. And most of all, note well wherein kind nature meant you to excel. Dr. Matthews says that to no other cause, perhaps, is failure in life so frequently to be traced as to a mistaken calling. We can often find out by hard knocks and repeated failures what we cannot do before what we can do. This negative process of eliminating the doubtful chances is often the only way of attaining to the positive conclusion. How many men have been made ridiculous for life by choosing law or medicine or theology simply because they are honorable professions? These men might have been respectable farmers or merchants, but are nobodies in such vocations. The very glory of the profession which they thought would make them shining lights simply renders more conspicuous their incapacity. Thousands of youths receive an education that fits them for a profession which they have not the means or inclination to follow, and that unfits them for the conditions of life to which they were born. Unsuccessful students with a smattering of everything are raised as much above their original condition as if they were successful. A large portion of Paris cabmen are unsuccessful students in theology and other professions and also unfrocked priests. They are very bad cabmen. Tompkins forsakes his last and all for literary squabbles. Styles himself poet, but his trade remains the same. He cobbles. Don't choose a profession or occupation because your father or uncle or brother is in it. Don't choose a business because you inherit it or because parents or friends want you to follow it. Don't choose it because others have made fortunes in it. Don't choose it because it is considered the proper thing and a genteel business. The mania for a genteel occupation, for a soft job which eliminates drudgery, thorns, hardships and all disagreeable things, and one which can be learned with very little effort, ruins many a youth. When we try to do that for which we are unfitted, we are not working along the line of our strength, but of our weakness. Our willpower and enthusiasm become demoralized. We do half work, botched work, lose confidence in ourselves and conclude that we are dunces because we cannot accomplish what others do. The whole tone of life is demoralized and lowered because we are out of place. How it shortens the road to success, to make a wise choice of one's occupation early, to be started on the road of a proper career while young, full of hope, while the animal spirits are high and enthusiasm is vigorous, to feel that every step we take that every day's work we do, that every blow we strike, helps to broaden, deepen, and enrich life. Those who fail are, as a rule, those who are out of their places. A man out of his place is but half a man. His very nature is perverted. He is working against his nature, rowing against the current. 
when his strength is exhausted he will float down the stream. A man cannot succeed when his whole nature is entering its perpetual protest against his occupation. To succeed, his vocation must have the consent of all his faculties. They must be in harmony with his purpose. Has a young man a right to choose an occupation which will only call into play his lower and inferior qualities as cunning, deceit, letting all his nobler qualities shrivel and die? Has he a right to select a vocation that will develop only the beast within him instead of the man, which will call out the bulldog qualities only, the qualities which overreach and grasp, the qualities which get and never give, which develop long-headedness only, while his higher self atrophies? The best way to choose an occupation is to ask yourself the question, what would my government do with me if it were to consider scientifically my qualifications and adaptations and place me to the best possible advantage for all the people? The Norwegian precept is a good one. Give thyself wholly to thy fellow men. They will give thee back soon enough. We can do the most possible for ourselves when we are in a position where we can do the most possible for others. We are doing the most for ourselves and for others when we are in a position which calls into play in the highest possible way the greatest number of our best faculties. In other words, we are succeeding best for ourselves when we are succeeding best for others. The time will come when there will be institutions for determining the natural bent of the boy and girl, where men of large experience and close observation will study the natural inclination of the youth, help him to find where his greatest strength lies and how to use it to the best advantage. Even if we take for granted what is not true, that every youth will sooner or later discover the line of his greatest strength, so that he may get his living by his strong points rather than by his weak ones. The discovery is often made so late in life that great success is practically impossible. Such institutions would help boys and girls to start in their proper careers early in life, and an early choice shortens the way. Can anything be more important to human beings than a start in life in the right direction, where even small effort will count for more in the race than the greatest effort, and a life of drudgery in the wrong direction? A man is seldom unsuccessful, unhappy, or vicious when he is in his place. After once choosing your occupation, however, never look backward. Stick to it with all the tenacity you can muster. Let nothing tempt you or swerve you a hair's breadth from your aim, and you will win. Do not let the thorns which appear in every vocation or temporary despondency or disappointment shake your purpose. You will never succeed while smarting under the drudgery of your occupation if you are constantly haunted with the idea that you could succeed better in something else. Great tenacity of purpose is the only thing that will carry you over the hard places which appear in every career to ultimate triumph. This determination or fixity of purpose has a great moral bearing upon our success, for it leads others to feel confidence in us, and this is everything. It gives credit and moral support in a thousand ways. People always believe in a man with a fixed purpose and will help him twice as quickly as one who is loosely or indifferently attached to his vocation and liable at any time to make a change or to fail. Everybody knows that determined men are not likely to fail. They carry in their very pluck, grit and determination the conviction and assurance of success. The world does not dictate what you shall do, but it does demand that you do something and that you shall be a king in your line. 
there is no grander sight than that of a young man or woman in the right place, struggling with might and main to make the most of the stuff at command, determined that not a faculty or power shall run to waste. Not money, not position, but power is what we want, and character is greater than any occupation or profession. Do not, I beseech you, said Garfield, be content to enter on any business that does not require and compel constant intellectual growth. Choose an occupation that is refining and elevating, an occupation that you will be proud of, an occupation that will give you time for self-culture and self-elevation, an occupation that will enlarge and expand your manhood and make you a better citizen, a better man. Power and constant growth toward a higher life are the great end of human existence. Your calling should be the great school of life, the great man developer, character builder, that which should broaden, deepen and round out into symmetry, harmony and beauty all the God-given faculties within you. But whatever you do, be greater than your calling. Let your manhood overtop your position, your wealth, your occupation, your title. A man must work hard and study hard to counteract the narrowing, hardening tendency of his occupation. Said Goldsmith, Burke, born for the universe, narrowed his mind, and to party gave up what was meant for mankind. Constant engagement in traffic and barter has no elevating influence, says Lindell. The endeavor to obtain the upper hand of those with whom we have to deal, to make good bargains, the higgling and scheming and the thousand petty artifices, which in these days of stern competition are unscrupulously resorted to, tend to narrow the sphere and to lessen the strength of the intellect, and at the same time the delicacy of the moral sense. Choose upward. Study the men in the vocation you think of adopting. Does it elevate those who follow it? Are they broad, liberal, intelligent men? Or have they become mere appendages of their profession, living in a rut with no standing in the community and of no use to it? Don't think you will be the great exception and can enter a questionable vocation without becoming a creature of it. In spite of all your determination and willpower to the contrary, your occupation, from the very law of association and habit, will seize you as in a vise, will mould you, shape you, fashion you, and stamp its inevitable impress upon you. How frequently do we see bright, open-hearted, generous young men come out of college with high hopes and lofty aims, enter a doubtful vocation, and in a few years return to college commencement, so changed that they are scarcely recognized. The once broad, noble features have become contracted and narrowed. The man has become grasping, avaricious, stingy, mean, hard. Is it possible, we ask, that a few years could so change a magnanimous and generous youth? Go to the bottom if you would get to the top. Be master of your calling in all its details. Nothing is small which concerns your business. Thousands of men who have been failures in life have done drudgery enough in half a dozen different occupations to have enabled them to reach great success. If their efforts had all been expended in one direction, that mechanic is a failure who starts out to build an engine but does not quite accomplish it and shifts into some other occupation where perhaps he will almost succeed, but stops just short of the point of proficiency in his acquisition, and so fails again. The world is full of people who are almost a success. They stop just this side of success. Their courage oozes out 
just before they become expert. How many of us have acquisitions which remain permanently unavailable because not carried quite to the point of skill? How many people almost know a language or two which they can neither write nor speak, a science or two whose elements they have not quite acquired, an art or two partially mastered but which they cannot practice with satisfaction or profit. The habit of desultoriness, which has been acquired by allowing yourself to abandon a half-finished work, more than balances any little skill gained in one vocation which might possibly be of use later. Beware of that frequently fatal gift, versatility. Many a person misses being a great man by splitting into two middling ones. Universality is the ignis fatus, which has deluded to ruin many a promising mind. In attempting to gain a knowledge of half a hundred subjects, it has mastered none. The jack of all trades, says one of the foremost manufacturers of this country, had a chance in my generation. In this, he has none. The measure of a man's learning will be the amount of his voluntary ignorance, said Thoreau. If we go into a factory where the mariner's compass is made, we can see the needles before they are magnetized. They will point in any direction. But when they have been applied to the magnet and received its peculiar power, from that moment they point to the north and are true to the pole ever after. So man never points steadily in any direction until he has been polarized by a great master purpose. Give your life, your energy, your enthusiasm, all to the highest work of which you are capable. Canon Farrar said, There is only one real failure in life possible, and that is not to be true to the best one knows. What must I do to be forever known? Thy duty ever. Who does the best his circumstance allows, does well, acts nobly, angels could do no more. Young. Whoever can make two ears of corn, two blades of grass to grow upon a spot of ground where only one grew before, says Swift, would deserve better of mankind and do more essential service to his country than the whole race of politicians put together. End of chapter 11. Choosing a vocation. Recorded by Luke Sartor, Brisbane, Queensland.